Good morning and welcome to the ASV's Galactic Center Star Party Astrophotography Session. Um, before we begin, I'd like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, uh, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their, their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Uh, this morning we bring you our second stream for the weekend. Uh, it will focus on astrophotography and in particular image processing. Uh, speaking today we will have the ASV's Astrophotography Section Director Tom Fowler uh, presenting for us. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping as we do at the start of every stream. Uh, we still have raffle tickets for the Iptron Tracking Mount available. There's just over 200 left. They're nearly sold out. So if you haven't got one, grab a ticket. Um, it's drawn tonight at about 9 o'clock. Uh, Facebook stars. I think we've already had someone donate stars. Thank you, Lee, for those stars. Uh, so if you want to donate stars so we can keep bringing you uh, these sessions, that would be great. Um, and obviously we have on YouTube, we have stickers, and we are still trying to work out how that works. Um, and also don't forget, if you're watching us for the first time, to uh, get the bell on for YouTube and follow us on Facebook and uh, follow us on YouTube as well. But now let's get stuck into processing with Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, ASV. Good morning, astrophotography section. <laughs> so, Tom, tell us what you're going to do today. Well, I'm going to walk through the processing of um, an image from... Uh, from uh, raw, demo, uh, raw data out of the camera right through to the finished image ready for uh, display on the web or a screen and also uh, ready to be printed. So uh, Printed, okay. What, whole, image, what, what, what target are we, are we looking at? Um, today's data is from uh, Messier 20. It's a, a nice, bright, interesting nebula. Uh, close to the center of the Milky Way. Um, and it's it's a complex nebula. It's a combination of reflection nebula, which is blue, and bright pink emission nebulae. And it's also got some dark nebula. It's, um, as I say, it's quite a complex object. And uh, there's a lot, a lot of detail there that can be pulled out, teased out of, a, of this data. Oh, did you want to take it away then? We'll get your presentation up and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, and, and Hayden's right. I kind of did do my hair in the colour of Trifford Nebula in <laughs> honour of it. Take it away. Um, thanks for that, Mark. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the synergies. Okay, so um, we're going to be processing an, an LRB image. Um, if time permits, we might look at some hydrogen alpha as well. But basically, the, we're going to be looking at um, putting together an LRGB image. This, um, this data set was captured uh, from uh, a remote observatory in, um, in uh, central Victoria with dark skies. Um, so the, the data is um, has the benefits of being captured with under a dark sky. I imaged it using a um, a corrected Dale Kirkham telescope. That's a, a reflector telescope with uh, 250 millimeters aperture and 1,450 millimeter focal length. I used a CCD camera, a monochrome camera that um, is designed for astronomy. It's a cooled camera with a filter wheel um, and um, red, green, blue luminance filters and a hydrogen alpha filter. The camera is, uh, it's a crop sensor. It's a micro four third sensor. So the crop factor for those that are uh, into the things like this is a crop factor of two. So it means that the um, imaging train is equivalent to a 2,900 millimeter focal length camera uh, lens on a full frame camera. 
in terms of field of view. So it's quite a small field of view. Uh, the other th significant thing about the camera is that it's a 16-bit uh, sensor. Um, I've got to click on that window. So red, green, blue, luminance filter. The luminance filter is basically clear. And there is hydrogen alpha data as well. I don't know whether we'll have time to look at that. I guide the setup as uh, the focal length uh, is long enough, so it, the imaging has to be guided. So I use a guide camera to keep the scope pointing at the object. And it's all riding on an Astrophysics 1100 mount, which you can see down here just. Uh, this is an image um, taken from a video free, a feed of my observatory, uh, just opened up um, at dusk to let everything um, cool down, let um, the air inside the observatory and the, the telescope all reach ambient temperature. I've got to click over here to move on to the next slide. What I'm going to talk about today really is um, how we manage noise in astro images. Um, so we're going to talk about the sources of noise in astro images, and then we'll get round to how we um, how we uh, mitigate those noise sources. Um, noise is introduced in a number of ways. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is just the act of reading the sensor of a, a camera, any camera, uh, generates noise. And um, in this case, we call it read noise. The CCD sensor that I use is fairly noisy. Um, it has, well, I say it's fairly noisy. It has significant read noise. Um, and um, we'll, we'll talk about how I mitigate that read noise. The next uh, source of noise is just the random movement of electrons uh, as they, they're sitting in the silicon uh, chip that detects the sensor. Um, the warmer that silicon is, the more the electrons bounce around and then physically move in the, in the substrate of the silicon in the sensor itself. And so this is called thermal noise and we mitigate it and we'll talk about mitigating the thermal noise. There's a couple of tricks we use there. Um, the next source of noise is introduced by the imaging train itself. It's, it's things like dust donuts um, in the images caused by dust on surfaces in the imaging train. So dust on the sensor, dust on the filters, dust on lenses, dust on mirrors. This causes dust donuts, we call them. I'll show you some of those. They really are donuts. Vignetting is something that um, you might have noticed with your digital camera. It's, it's what happens when um, the image that's projected onto the sensor, um, it's, not, it's often not as bright in the corners as it is in the center of the image. And so we, we measure all this, these things and we have a means of getting rid of all of that noise. The next source of noise is uh, caused by the nature of the light that reaches our sensor. Now, I'm talking about deep sky astro imaging here. So almost by definition, the, the objects that we're imaging are very faint. And we don't get very many photons from these objects hitting our sensor. We might, it, if it's a really faint object, it might be 10 photons a second that we're, we're actually capturing. And it might be less than that if we're really, um, we're really pushing to go deep. And um, they, they arrive in a random, a random way. And so it's, it's not 
10 photons every second and a tenth of a second per photon. It's, it's, it's really a, a random uh, distribution of how often the, these photons arrive. And that causes what we call shot noise. It, it is a real source of noise and we need to mitigate against that as well. The next class of uh, noise is um, things that are not associated directly with the equipment we're using or the target we're shooting, but um, maybe where we're shooting, uh, light pollution, when we're shooting, maybe moonlight, and then other things that just happen, uh, things like satellites passing through our field of view, meteors, um, aeroplanes, fireflies, you name it, there's, there's no shortage. Asteroids. I, I copped an asteroid passing through uh, some of my uh, images last, just last week. So we need to, we need to have a, a strategy for dealing with these things because no one wants a nice deep image of the Triffin Nebula with a, a flashing red and green light through it from uh, <laughs> the lights on the wingtips of the aeroplane that happen to fly through. And the other thing is um, things that happen, particularly when you're running a remote observatory and you don't actually get to, uh, to uh, look after the gear possibly as often or as, uh, as much as you'd like. And I'm talking here about things like dust settling on uh, optical surfaces, wildlife, the effects of wildlife, spiders, um, putting nice big webs across the aperture of your telescope, birds getting into your observatory and yeah, these things um, send shivers down a remote <laughs> observers. Um, um, soul, because uh, some, of them are, some of them are hard to deal with, without, uh, particularly in lockdown. How do we mitigate these noise sources? Each one of those we need, we need to manage because any one of them would uh, detract from our images. And if we mitigate carefully, we can actually get around all of them. Um, the first set and the first group of them, we mitigate by calibrating our, uh, our images. And later on, the later ones I mentioned, mainly we mitigate by stacking multiple images. And so we can, we can remove the effects of aeroplanes and one-off events by, um, by having enough images without the, the event to be able to average them out or remove them as we, we combine and stack. So, I talked about read noise. This is the noise that's introduced by um, by actually reading the sensor. Um, one of the the ways we mitigate read noise is by taking what we call bias frames. Now, a bias frame we're looking at one here. A bias frame is a zero length exposure. So, to take this, I got the camera into the, the condition it's in when I'm going to be imaging and I just blasted away and I ended up with um, quite a few of these hundreds of them um, that are just zero length exposures and so the I don't know how well you can see the detail in that if I, I can uh, if I brighten it up you can see that there are there is detail in that uh, that frame and it's it's all read noise it's what the noise that the camera introduced um, not having done any exposure the shutter never opened um, there was no time to for um, it's a zero length exposure so no time for signal to accumulate it's just the reading of the signal the sensor that um, that generated this noise and if I stack a heap of them, I end up with this guy, 
Oh, well, that's a bit too bright. That is, um, I call it the master bias frame. It's effectively the average noise generated by my camera when it, just when it reads. And you can see there that there are really column-based um, imperfections in the camera. And there's, there is a, a column up here on the right-hand side that is uh, that has low read noise, but it also has low signal measuring. Um, it's not a dead column, but it's it's not as lively as some. Here's a column that is the life of the party. It uh, it's a bit more sensitive. And on the sides, we've got this glow, and then both sides of the camera, left and right side. Um, this is. Um, this is probably caused by um, uneven cooling, uneven temperature of uh, the sensor. And um, it's not evident in a single, a single bias frame, but when you stack them and you, you remove the random variations and you just look at the pattern that's, that's left, um, you can see that there's quite, a, quite an impact there. And these, the bias frames that are stacked here were taken over a, um, a uh, at least a 12 hour period. So the, the camera was turned on for a long time. It, it, it reached its thermal equilibrium. Um, and this is really representative of the behavior of the camera in the real world as it, as it took those uh, bias frames. So that, that's bias frames, uh, are mitigated by taking, uh, sorry, read noise is mitigated by taking bias frames and calibrating with them. The next one is thermal noise. Um, mitigate that by two things. The first one is that um, I mentioned that the thermal noise is dependent on the temperature of the sensor. This camera cools the sensor to minus 20 degrees. Um, it'll cool it up to 45 degrees below the ambient temperature, but it's, I run it at minus 20 and its temperature control is really stable. So um, by reducing the temperature to minus 20, um, every 5.6 degrees you lower the temperature of silicon, you halve the thermal noise. So by taking it down 45 degrees uh, from a summer night, you can see that I'm actually reducing that thermal noise a significant amount. And the other mitigation strategy is to actually measure the thermal noise at minus 20 degrees. And I do that by taking dark frames. And if we look at it, there is There is a single dark frame. It's 30 minutes long because some of my images, my hydrogen alpha is a 30 minute exposure. So I need a, a dark frame that's the same length as my HA. And in this one, you can see my friendly little dark column in the sensor. I don't know whether you can see that, um, but it's certainly there in, in all its glory. And you can see these bright patches. Now, the bright patches are actually, um, they're not uh, caused by the sensor directly. They're not caused by faults in the sensor. They actually vary from frame to frame. If I open up another one of these. Um, Here's another one. You'll see that they've jumped. They're caused by radiation striking the center of the camera. They're caused possibly by cosmic rays, for example, striking the sensor during the half hour that, the that I was accumulating this data. I nearly said with the shutter open, but these are taken again with the shutter show closed. So half an hour, the camera just sits there accumulating the noise 
And then I stack um, quite a lot of them. I stack um, uh, maybe 12 of them. Um, you can see how many I have. There, there, there's more than 12. There's 24 there. So uh, it's 12 hours of data that I stack to create this guy, which is a master dark. And if you look at it, you'll see that all the cosmic ray hits are gone. The, the image is, has a... This image is really stretched to highlight the differences between, uh, between pixels. But um, there are still dark columns in the, in the image. There's one over here on the right. There's one over here on the left. There, these two columns are a bit less sensitive than the, uh, the rest of the sensor, but uh, the calibration process using darks and bias frames will take all of that variation out of the, the calibrated image. Um, the, other, the other thing that will be removed, well, there's a lot of other things that will be removed by this process. But um, looking at this image, there are not really very many hot pixels in this camera. There are no, there might be one, a single pixel there that's, um, that's um, a bit more sensitive. If we zoom in, we're looking one to one here now. Um, there's the odd the odd angry pixel in there, but there's not too many hot pixels. Um, and we've measured the camera. We've measured the, the noise that the camera introduces. So uh, we use that to, to calibrate out those aspects of the noise. When it comes to noise introduced by the imaging train, by vignetting, by dust uh, on uh, optical surfaces, etc., we use things called flat frames. Now, a flat frame is um, is an image or a, a group of images that are obtained by imaging a uniform light source um, and actually measuring the, the vignetting, measuring the variation of illumination across the field. And I take sky flats by um, measuring, taking images of the sky at dawn and dusk when um, in a part of the sky that's um, away from the, the sun and hopefully doesn't have any gradients in it. And I can show you what a flat frame looks like. It's something like that. That's a, a blue sky flat. It's a dawn flat, that one. It was taken um, taken at dawn with the blue filter. You can see stars in it because um, it's early dawn. Um, the stars are still visible. But uh, you can see these lovely dust donuts. These are, these are caused by dust um, in the imaging train. You can see different sizes of dust donuts. Here's a nice big one. Lots of these, that's a very prominent dark one. Lots of them are the same size. And the size of the dust donut tells you how far away it was from the imaging sensor. The further it is from the sensor, the bigger the dust donut. And so these, I call them little, but they're not that small. Um, these are actually on the cover glass of the sensor. So they're the first external surface um, outside the center of, of the camera as you move away from the sensor. This is the first optical surface on the outside of the sensor cavity. And you can see there are lots of dust donuts there. Um, this guy is bigger. He's on the blue filter. And there's a stack of um, blue flat frames. There's a combination of dawn and dusk flats here. Um, 
these are all taken with the blue filter. So here's our, our dust donut from the blue filter. You can see the corners are darker. This is, uh, this is vignetting at play. Even though my sensor is, um, is small, it's a crop factor of two. Um, and the telescope has an imaging circle of 42 millimeters and my, um, my sensor is 21 millimeter diagonal. There is still vignetting evident. And uh, by using this, uh, this, uh, this uh, flat frame, I'll be able to remove the impact of that, uh, that vignetting from the final images. So just quickly, there's the, there's the blue master flat. This one's green. And this one's red. And if I just scan through those quickly, you can see the blue one has the dust donut on it. The green one has, oh, sorry, the, the dust donut from the filter wheel. The green one has a, a filter wheel dust donut on the bottom here, but doesn't, not the one in the position of the blue filter. And when I put the red, um, when I put the filter wheels in last, I actually managed, by the look of it, to get all the dust off the red filter. Uh, but the sensor glass, um, the sensor glass um, dust donuts are all, they don't move, they're on all filters. Okay, so that's, that's flat frames. Um, and I use them to, to mitigate um, vignetting and, um, and dust and spider webs um, uh, on the optical surfaces. Next form of noise is shot noise. Um, and this is the random arrival of photons from the, uh, from the target. Mitigation strategy there um, varies from only imaging bright objects to um, uh, if I want to image really deeply, if I want to image dark, faint objects, I need to take a lot of exposures. And I need to, um, I need to um, take these exposures and then uh, stack them and average out the random noise that uh, that is left after the calibration phase. And um, hopefully what I'm left with is signal and the signal re, um, might not be any appear any stronger than the random background noise, but the signal noise is repeatable and when I average it, 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 um, it doesn't cancel itself out. The background noise is random and disappears in the averaging process. So to deal with shot noise, take lots of sub exposures and um, um, stack them and average them. Now, Tom, we have a question for you yeah. regarding your donuts. Yeah. I, I personally want to know if they're glazed or not. Um, but <laughs> Andrew wants to know, why don't you clean the windows to remove the dust donuts? There's a reason you don't clean them. Um, there is. I do clean the filters, although some sorts of filters uh, you shouldn't clean because um, the, the filter material is gelatine. Um, but my filters are hard. Uh, a hard surface on uh, an optical glass substrate. And so I very delicately clean them. The last thing you want to do is put a scratch on your filter. Um, the, the noise, uh, the dust donuts that I have on the, the glass of the, um, the sensor in this camera, yes, they're measurable. Yes, they are detectable, but there's certainly, um, you can calibrate them out and you'll see through the calibration process, they absolutely completely disappear. 
And so rather than opening the camera up and, um, and trying to clean it, uh, at the moment, this camera is at a state where it's producing, the, where those um, dust particles are not influencing the, the image quality at all. Uh, so it, it really isn't worth the, worth the risk or the, um, the difficulty of opening the camera and, and resolving them. Uh, the camera has a shutter and you have to clean the, the sensor glass, you actually have to wedge the shutter open and get inside it somehow with Q-tips or something and, um, and clean the, the sensor. It's not like your Canon DSLR that has automatic sensor cleaning um, hardware. Um, and so uh, at the moment, uh, my attitude is while I can live with it without it affecting the imaging at all, let sleeping dogs lie. <laughs> There's another one for you, and I'm not sure you might actually be coming up to this, but we'll ask it anyway. Chris wants to know, do you process the bias or dark frames at all before the image is stacked? Now, I'm not sure if you're going to get to this further down, but sort of I, I've, um, I've shown you, um, I've shown everything, um, individual bias, frames and the, the master bias, which is effectively just a stack of the bias frames. I've shown you individual dark frames and the master dark, which is a stack of the dark frames. Yep. And the flat frames, um, what I've done with those is I've stacked them, which removes the impact of things like uh, the stars that are in dawn and dusk, in some dawn and dusk flats. And I've subtracted the bias from, in fact, I've subtracted the master bias from the flat frames before I stack them. So I've made a set of master calibration frames uh, that, that are basically stacked. Um, and some of them, the, the flat frames have had the master bias subtracted. But, um, we will get to um, what I do with those in a minute, but uh, yeah, the the actual creation of those stacks and the 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 uh, process to get them to get to them, um, I wasn't planning to to go into that, but we can we can talk about it if people are interested. Um, I think they might be. So. <laughs> um, I don't know. Do we? The risk is if we go into that depth now, we're going to run out of time in Photoshop at the end, putting it together. And um, I'm very happy to do, to come back and look at any aspect of this that we we want to, if we've got time at the end. I'm very happy yeah, to- That's probably to, a good idea. Continue on. And then if we've got time, come back to that. If we don't have time, I'm happy to do this, look at any burrow down into any of this that people might want to look at at a, a later date if if there's no interest um i love talking about this stuff uh, <laughs> we can certainly yeah. we can always do another stream we can always do another stream yep so um yeah let's for the moment i'm sorry it's who's you know, chris's question yes it was yeah i'm sorry chris i'm going to I'm going to glaze over it a bit at the moment and say they're stacked. There is um, there is some sigma noise reduction um, uh, done in that stacking process, um, and I can go into the details. But uh, we'll run out of time if we if we do it now. We'll come back to it if we get if I still have time. Okay. Um, Light pollution is a, another uh, source of noise that I mitigate by um, imaging from a dark site, a sky site. I'm very fortunate my observatory is in a, a dark sky site, but uh, for uh, ASV members, if you want to image LRGB, um, if you want to do LRGB imaging, 
LMDSS is a fabulous resource that's available to you. The sky is really dark and uh, it's LRGB imaging without a dark sky is just a recipe for frustration. And uh, so I, I urge you, if you can, make use of LMDSS or another dark the sky site. I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate that my observatory has access or gives me access to, to a, a dark site. Um, the moon is um, predictable but unavoidable um, unless you image around it. And I image around it by only shooting colour when the during the new moon week. Um, I won't shoot colour if the moon's in the sky at all uh, that night. So new moon nights, I'll shoot um, red, green, blue. On quarter moon nights, I shoot luminosity if the moon is down and I shoot hydrogen alpha if the moon is up. And the benefits of this strategy are that uh, by shooting colour when there is no moon at all that night, uh, I don't get um, I don't get gradients in my data. I uh, also only shoot within two hours of the meridian, so um, I'm I'm shooting the object. I'm always shooting the object when it's as high as it gets in the sky. And um, by avoiding it when it's low, and by avoiding shooting it when the moon is in the sky or nearly in the sky, I avoid gradients in the, the color. And color gradients are really hard to get rid of in post-processing, uh, particularly if you end up with a green gradient that's one way and a red gradient that's another way and a blue gradient that's some other way. Um, that is really difficult to deal with. And my Photoshop skills aren't up to it. So I capture the data um, in a way that avoids the, avoids the complexity caused by by uh, particularly the moon and um, light pollution. Uh, and yeah, avoid the moon is the, is the key to, to it for LRGB imaging. Now, Messier 20, let's, let's have a look at what Messier 20 is or where it is. Um, this is, um, before we go there, just before we go there. Um, where are we? Back here. One more step. Here we go. I acquired this data for Messier 20 between um, the 20th of uh, April this year and um, the 1st of August. And if we have a look in Stellarium, here we are on the 1st of August at 9 p.m. Messier 20 is let's zoom into it. And let's find the center on it. Messier 20. That's the that's the object I'm imaging. That's, you can see, is I've zoomed in a long way to get there. But um, at 9 p.m. on the, the 1st of August this year, this is where it was in the sky. Um, this is the zenith. The green line is the meridian. And here we go, this is the east. So. Messier 20 at 9 p.m. was approaching the meridian from the east. It's everything in the sky goes around the, it rises in the east, sets in the west. And here we are minute by minute, our 
this air 20 is approaching the meridian and in fact on the night of the 1st of August I started imaging it at 8 o'clock in the evening and it was here and I imaged it for two hours and it ended up there you can see that it it in that two hour window it crossed the meridian and every night that I imaged it I imaged it in a two hour window and it crossed the meridian in that two hours and by doing that I avoided uh, the complication of having um, that you, the complication you get when you shoot to, load to the horizon where you get the impact of light pollution from um, from uh, uh, human endeavor let's call it from uh, from uh, cities towns and human activity that is always greatest at the horizon and you really need an extremely dark site not to be able to see this sky glow due to, to light pollution and particularly in, in my dark sky site um, the um, the worst of the light pollution for, for my side is actually in the southwest. Um, the Melbourne sky uh, dome is down here in the southwest. And so I've imaged this object where it's as far away from uh, horizon effects as I can get it. I'm as pointing as high in the sky as I can to image it. And um, Let's, we've seen where it is. We can close that. Um, so what I've, the data that I collected over this time period was um, 77 uh, light frames through red, green, blue filters. That's a total of 77, not 77 of each. These are two minute exposures, total of two hours and 34 minutes. And they were taken in a mode um, of the CCD sensor where the, the 8 megapixel sensor of the camera actually made, uh, combined four pixels, four adjacent pixels into one. So bin two means that you take two, two pixels on two rows and two columns and so four adjacent pixels and you clump them together as one pixel. So my eight megapixel camera turned into a two megapixel mode to take these 77 um, light frames. Um, they were all acquired with no moon, new moon nights and within two hours of the meridian. I've harped on about that. Um, and there are 47 luminance subs uh, these ones are four minutes long and bin one. The sensor was in its highest resolution mode. It's an eight megapixel. These are eight megapixel images. Um, and this is three hours and eight minutes of data. And there's, these were acquired when I say moonless nights. They, they were acquired when the moon wasn't in the sky, but it, did it rise afterwards or set off or set before I took these uh, luminance subs and they're all taken right at the, the highest the object got in the sky. Now there's nothing magic about the two hours and 34 minutes or the three hours and eight minutes. Um, I looked at the data over the three months that I was capturing it and I I did quick and, uh, quick and dirty processing along the way and I decided that the object was bright enough and that I had enough data by the, um, the beginning of August that uh, all the noise sources that could be mitigated in this, this image had been 
And in fact, if I wanted to have the amount of noise that was present in the image, uh, that was still present in the image, I'd have to acquire twice as much data. And that, that ratio of half the noise, get twice as much data, actually applies throughout the, the imaging process. And so if you look at your image, you say, oh, wouldn't it be nice if there was only half as much noise in it? Um, I'm very fortunate. I have a remote observatory. I can, I can choose to take more data. Um, and to have the have the noise, I just fire away, take twice as much data. And for some some objects, some faint objects, um, I'll start shooting them when they rise just just after five a.m. And I'll shoot them all the way through till they're setting at seven p.m. So three, four, or five months of the year. And if I still don't have enough data to get rid of, to get the noise under control as much as I want, I'll have to come back next year. Um, frustrating as that might be. So, but um, the Triffid is a nice bright object and uh, the star field around it is quite dense. There's, it's close to the center of the Milky Way. There are plenty of stars. And so um, there's plenty of places for noise to hide in the, uh, in the shadows in this image and uh, go unnoticed. And this total of, um, what did I say, um, total of five hours, 42 minutes of exposure was enough to, I think you'll agree when we finish this, absolutely get the noise under control. Um, the other thing I took in those three months, three and a half months was in when the moon was up, I actually also acquired um, eight hours of hydrogen alpha data. Uh, so six 30 minute, uh, 16 30 minute exposures of hydrogen alpha. Um, and at the moment, I, I've not incorporated those into this, this image. I haven't, I haven't actually incorporated them into any, I haven't pro produced a final image from them. Um, I'm going through a phase at the moment where I really like RGB images. I particularly like um, dark nebulae and reflection nebulae. And um, this LRGB process that I'm showing you now um, really highlights those things. And it's very tricky to uh, add to a, a good LRGB image without sacrificing particularly the reflection nebula. And so, uh, at the moment, I've got eight hours of data there, um, but I haven't haven't um, made any use of it. Now we've spoken about um, calibration frames, um, what they are. You can see that I've actually got fifty half hour dark uh, frames. So there's twenty four hours of of uh, more than 24 hours of dark um, dark frames to make two master darks, one for the bin one data and another one for the bin two data. Uh, for the bias frames, there's um, a lot of those for to make two master biases, one bin one and one bin two. And sky flats, there's uh, 60 reds to make a master, a bin two red master flat and a bin two green master flat and a bin two blue master flat, 60 of each of them. And um, 90 luminance flats. Now, why 60 and 90? Um, I have a process where I can, uh, I have a program where I can, a sequence where I can shoot 30 dusk flats, red, green, blue in one night, one dusk. And I have another one where I can shoot 30 red, green, blue dawn flats in one dawn. So that's actually one dusk and one dawn of red, green, blue. And 
the hydrogen alpha, uh, sorry, the luminance ones are getting conjunction with hydrogen alpha. Um, the hydrogen alpha filter is really, uh, it's a narrow band filter and it doesn't let a lot of light through. And so uh, on a dusk, for example, where I'm shooting um, hydrogen dusk flats, there's a lot of that dusk that's not bright enough for HA flats. And so I just shoot, I bang away and shoot loom flats after I've, um, after the HA flats become too slow. And the same in dawn, when I'm shooting dawn flats for HA, I'll shoot uh, loom flats first and then HA when just before the sun rises. So I, I have um, some sequences that, uh, that give me this, this number of um, flats, um, basically from one, one dawn and dusk for um, RGB and one dawn and dusk for HA and loom. And that's what I end up with. Um, this is the imaging software that uh, I'm going to be showing you. Uh, Mark's going to put these um, links in the chat. Yeah, I'll but chuck I'll... them in the chat. Just before you continue, Tom, yeah. Um, Kevin wants to know, uh, how often do you redo your dark bias frames and do they last a long time? It's a similar question to what James had of, uh, do you make the darks, etc., fresh for every photo session? So is this, I the... can answer that. Yep. Go for it. And while um, you do that, I will pop all these links in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, best practice I believe is to take darks and biases every three months. Um, and I try to do that, but um, I'm not as diligent as maybe I could be. <laughs> and um, if we have a look here, um, if I have a look at my darks and biases, um, there you go, I took them in February. I'm well, I'm well and truly overdue. Um, six months now and I will certainly be taking them soon because um, I shoot them the darks and biases during the day um, and um, my camera can only cool 45 degrees below ambient so um, I need the camera at imaging temperature to shoot darks and biases so I can't do it if the ambient temperature is above 25. So uh, can't shoot darks and biases in summer. Now's the time to be <laughs> to be doing. This. I was just going to say summer's coming, so exactly. to get onto it. <laughs> so that's the story with darks and biases. For flats, um, I take flats whenever I disassemble the imaging train. So if I change the filter wheel, or I change a filter, or um, do any work on the telescope, clean the mirror, do anything like that, that will prompt a new set of flats. Uh, and again, I guess three monthly um, flats would be a good thing to do because um, that would mitigate against things like spiders, things, dust accumulating on the sensor, uh, on the optical surfaces. But as you'll see with this data, when we put it all together, it really calibrates very cleanly. And uh, it's, it's on the to-do list and I will be doing it before too long. But uh, life is simple when you have a, have a library of calibration frames and you can just bang away at them for six months. Okay. Um, my calibration and stacking workflow is done in CCD stack. We'll be looking at that. I calibrate the color in uh, a lovely little utility by Bob Frankie called uh, Excalibrator. There's the link to Excalibrator in the web, on the web. It's free software, download it from that website. But it needs, um, 
it needs web access because um, you feed it a plate solved image and it goes away and identifies stars in that image and interrogates um, uh, databases to determine what color those stars really are and um, does a star color calibration based on the stars that are in your image. I'm going to be using Photoshop. I'll be demonstrating in um, the current version of Photoshop CC, but this workflow works exactly the same in CS6 uh, and presumably going back before that, I don't think there's anything that I'm doing that is, uh, well, I know there's nothing CC specific and I, I don't know how far back. I've not used Photoshop before CS6, but uh, I'm not relying on um, on the latest and greatest features of Photoshop in any of the process. I use a set of um, Photoshop actions by published by Noel Carboni for specifically for um, astro imaging and processing ast uh, astrophotography. I love these these actions. I I don't use all of them, but the ones that I do use, I, they really form uh, the basis of a lot of my uh, processing in Photoshop. And the other thing that I need to mention is um, you really need to calibrate your monitor to do this work because uh, you need to be able to to see if you're black clipping. You really need to be able to see, um, to to be able to see the, the full dynamic range of your monitor, of your data on the monitor, um, to be able to tell whether you're clipping or you're clipping dark, the highlights or the shadows. So calibrate your monitor before you get too involved in, uh, in processing images. Certainly the Photoshop stage, you, you really need a calibrated monitor. Um, and this is the one that I use. Um, it works. I believe the ASV has a, a monitor calibrator somewhere that can be borrowed, but uh, I'm not, I've never borrowed it. I don't know who the custodian is, but um, I understand that there is an ASV monitor calibrator floating around somewhere. Okay, we'll come back to this, but we're going to start with looking at the loom data. Now, this is this is a single luminance. Um, subframe and um, this is a four minute sub. Um, this particular one happened to be captured on the 21st of April. Um, and we've spoken quite a lot of depth about where where the, uh, the target was at the time but uh, basically it was high in the sky and uh, uh, away from the influences of light pollution and the moon. And so it's, what am I reading down here? You can see in the very bottom, maybe of the, um, the status bar there, there's about 50, 40, 24. There's somewhere around about 50 counts in the black down there. If I go up here, 40. 30. There, there, in this corner, 50, 37, 42. There's certainly no strong gradients, 36, 45. There's no strong gradients in that, that image. Um, and the effects of the dust donuts are there, but they're pretty hard to see. The effects of the vignetting is there, but it's pretty, it's hard to tell, hard to see. But let's just load up um, 
all of these loom subs and see what they look like. So these are somewhat less than 20, I think, if I remember correctly, all taken on that um, fateful day. There were 14. Uh, taken on the 21st of April. Um, in a two-hour um, slot, I can typically get 21, 20 or 21 subs. And so the fact that I got 14 on that night means that I was probably clouded in for some of it. Uh, this next night, 20th of May, um, I might have got a few more than 14. I did get more than 14. I might have got the full 20, 21 subs that night. Um, 14, I got 18. So again, I didn't get a clear two-hour run at it. But the observatory detects clouds and closes, shuts um, if it's if the conditions aren't right to image. And so, uh, in three nights, I got my forty-seven loom images, and there they are, all loaded in CCD stack. Now, um, they're they're just loaded up at the moment in order of exposure, I think. Let's make them exposure, date and time. Now, if I, there's the first one. If I just blink these, you see they're jumping around and flipping over. The, there are two effects happening here. The, the little jumps between successive images, uh, what we call dithering. And that's that's something we do deliberately. Uh, between every frame, we move the telescope a little bit between frames so that the a particular feature, any feature in the image, doesn't fall on the same pixel of the camera in every shot. Let's say I had a dead pixel or I had a a, uh, a hot pixel, it was always white. Uh, I don't want any particular um, part of this image to fall on a pixel that's not not going to be taking um, taking good data. Uh, so shift the image around on the sensor and stacking will average out the, the noise introduced by imperfections in the sensor. So that's why they they skip around. And that flip, that big jump where the image is basically turned upside down and uh, is oriented the other way, is, has happened because in these the first set, these ones, uh, I was imaging as the object was rising from the in the east towards the meridian. And as it crossed over the meridian, my mount had to flip and the telescope um, changed sides of the of the meridian and was now and pointing to the object in the west. So when the object's in the east back here, the telescope's actually in the west pointing east. And when the object crosses over the meridian and the object is in the west and setting, uh, the telescope flips over to the east and points across to the west. And because I don't have a rotator in my imaging train, I can't rotate the image, the camera. Um, the images are inverted after the meridian flip. So you can see here I am imaging in the west, and then here I am the next day, the next night I was imaging back in the east as the object's rising. As it crosses the meridian I flipped, I'm now imaging in the west. So 
you can see that um, you can see a few noise mitigation um, uh, there's a few aspects of the noise mitigation here. The dithering is all about reducing noise, removing noise that the sensor introduces. Um, but you can also see mechanical um, influences caused by uh, using a, an equatorial mount. Um, the thing is, an equatorial mount, you need to do a meridian flip. Okay, so here are 47 light frames, and they're loaded into CCD stack. Let's calibrate them. Now, to calibrate them, what, what we end up doing is um, subtracting the bias frame and subtracting a percentage of the dark frame corresponding to the exposure length of this light zone. Now, I said the the darks were um, 30 minutes long. These, um, these light frames are four minutes long. And so I need to subtract four thirtieths of the dark frame from each of these light frames. And I need to subtract the bias frame from each of the light frames. And I need to divide what's left by the flat frame. So I point CCD stack to the master dark frame. And I point it to the master bias frame. And I show CCD stack where to find the flats. And they happen to be in this folder. And CCD stack will now calibrate each of those soaps. Doing its thing nicely there, isn't it? It is. There's 47 subs here, so they're done. Oh, it wasn't too yeah. long. No, no, no. It's not. It's not too bad. Um, and I'm going to save them all. Now, I've got a directory structure here where I have the individual imaging nights in a directory um, that I call raw. And then above that, I have a directory I call calibrated. And surprisingly enough, I save them all in the calibrated folder. Um, because I might, I might want to come back and um, repeat, redo some of the, some of the processing. Um, I actually calibrate all the data that I get um, next morning. So my observatory runs hopefully all night. Um, and I wake up to find my Dropbox will have um, 180 data subs in it. And I'll, uh, I'll calibrate those um, that morning and do a, a quick a scan to make sure that the quality is good. But it's worth saving the calibrated data because um, we spoke about um, redoing the calibration frames. This data is really tied to its calibration frames. And um, to come back two years later and work out which calibration frames I should have used, I need to use to recalibrate these two-year-old light frames is I can tell you it's a headache and a heartache you don't need. So although I save the raw data, I also save the calibrated data. And it means that I can go back and redo any any stage of the calibration that I might want to do at any stage. Now, as we've been skipping through these loom subs, I've noticed that there are no uh, aeroplanes, there are no satellites, there are no uh, meteors. Uh, so I can't show you any of those in this particular data. But 
what I can do is I can show you that there's a, f a field over here called full width half max. I can sort the data on full width half max. Um, and this frame, for example, is the sharpest um, of all of these looms with a full width half max of 3.44 pixels. And this guy down the bottom is the slob of the set. He has a full width half max of 5.34 pixels. Um, and as, just as a, a, really, a really quick and dirty coarse uh, quality of the image type uh, assessment, this sharp one is the better one. And this guy down the bottom is probably the worst of the lot. But I'm going to pick the top one. I think that's the one I want to pick. Um, and I'm going to say that he's the best. And I'm going to align all the rest of them up with him. So I register everything with my with that reference frame, that best one. And I just say align them all. And this will it won't adjust the data. It will just work out what it needs to do to each of those um, subs to get them to align with the first one with the reference frame. Uh, now, while, the while, reference... It's, while it's doing yeah. that, Tom, yep. Marshall wants to know, are you using a professional level monitor for better image reproduction? I'm using a Dell uh, 4K screen I'm here. Um, and um, yeah, it might be better if I used a, a photographic, a special professional photographically aimed monitor, something with a wider gamut. But um, no, it's just a Dell office monitor, but it's 4K. Uh, and it's 27 inch, so it uh, helps my poor tired old eyes. <laughs> Um, for a long time, I did process my images on my 13 inch laptop. And one of the aha moments in my astro imaging odyssey was discovering a 27 inch monitor for, for processing. It really makes a big difference going to a big monitor. Um, so I have another, another question for you as well. Um, does CCD yeah. stack account for the Meridian flip, or do you have to manually unflip the flipped images? Well, I, we're about to see. I just said aligned all the images with the reference frame. Mm -hmm. And CCD stack has now aligned them all. So I say it's aligned them. It knows what it has to do to get each of them aligned. And now I have a the opportunity of choosing how it moves each of the, same, the frames. Now, it can um, it can interpolate. It can work out do a, a transform that involves recalculating the brightness of every pixel. But because this data is all bin one, it's all full resolution for the sensor. It's actually better if I just move each pixel of each image to the nearest pixel of the um, of its aligned self. Um, and so if there's a there's a pixel in one of the subs that had 200 uh, counts, um, I will move it to its position in the, or I will, CCD stack will move that 200 counts to the correct pixel location in the finished image. Um, I need to come back and talk about what 200 counts, 200 counts is actually misleading and I'll talk about what I should have said in just a moment. But let's apply this nearest neighbor transform to each of those images. And there's our reference frame. 
and here's the next one and here we go blinking through them and yes the meridian flip has happened it's been incorporated but you can actually still see I, I don't know can you see that there there is movement between these yeah. subs still yeah there's a tiny little bit of movement isn't there there is mm. it's less than one pixel and it's because i did a nearest neighbor um transform to to align those subs and um, the effect of not interpolating means that actually when i stack it um i will get a sharper stack than if i i did a um an interpolation. So believe it or not, that little one pixel jump that you can see as I blink through these will actually result in a in a, a sharper image. The other thing you might note is that the full width half max at the end of that alignment process is actually the same as the unaligned images. So the sharpness of the individual subs is not affected by that alignment process. Now, I talked about moving 200 counts. Um, the camera takes 16 bit data. So the each pixel is a 16 bit integer when it comes out of the camera. But CCD stack, um, I am saving, um, I hope I am. Let me just check. Um, I'm saving 32-bit um, floating point um, data for when I save an image. And so um, all of this alignment is happening. Um, and I've screwed it up. I save TIFFs. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oops. Oops. Let's try that again. We'll delete those and we'll come back and do them again. Um, <laughs> these are actually being saved as 32-bit floating point TIFF files. Uh, GIF, did it again. again. <laughs> FITS files. And uh, just to make sure I do it properly, save all. I'm clambering up my cascade of directories here. This is an aligned directory. And I'm going to save them as 32-bit floating point FITS files. And um, yeah, there it is saving, saving those. And a wonderfully uh, slow. Pro oh, there we go. Done. There we go. We're done. And the next thing I'm going to do, now they're all aligned, um, I'm going to stack them and, um, and make just a single loom stack uh, for all of, this, all of this data. And that's actually the file that I'll take in Photoshop, one of them. So the next thing I need to do, I've registered them. Now I need to normalize them. Um, and I don't know, well, that's not what I wanted to click on. If we, if we just brighten up this guy a bit so we can see him. Whoa, look at that. There he is. That's that's our that's our favourite um, reference frame. But if I put that same screen stretch onto all of the subs and blink through them, you'll see that some of them are brighter and some of them not quite so bright. Mm -hmm. There's a variation in in brightness through them. Um, Normalization is the step that 
um, gets rid of that. So that's the next thing to do. And to normalize them, I again choose the reference frame. And I say normalize. And I want to tell the software what the darkest bit of the image is. And I'm going to pick a bit up here in the corner without stars. I'm going to say that should be as the darkest. And now it's asking me to select the highlight. I'm going to select a bit of the nebula here without bright stars in it, without saturated stars. But um, I'm going to say that's the, the brightest bit that I want you to use to um, normalize them. And what the software has now done is it's calculated a weighting and an offset for each of those subs to, so that their dark point will be the same for that area I chose up in the corner here, and they'll be the same brightness through here. Now, I can't show you that. The software doesn't show you it, but it's, it's done that calculation, and it actually... Um, show you here, it's calculated an offset and a scale factor for each of those images. And that allows me to do a data reject procedure now on every pixel in this image. And what it's doing is it's looking for every pixel here. It's looking at the the distribution of brightness of the pixels on all of those subs. And uh, I'm telling it to reject um, reject any image that is more than 2.2 sigma for the, um, the statisticians amongst us, away from the mean, the average of those, um, the, those subs in that pixel. And what this does is basically it rejects about 5% of all of the data on every sub on all the good subs. And if there's a bad sub, it'll reject a bit more. And if it's a particularly good sub, it might reject a bit less. But this particular sub that we're looking at here, it's rejecting 4.15% of the pixels in that sub. And if we, if we scan through them, I don't know, can you see this, the odd red pixel? in the bright parts there. They're yeah. the pixels that will get rejected when I combine these. And the red strip around the top here and down the side, that's changes for every image. But that's the area that where this image was moved to align it with the others, with the reference frame. They're the bits with no data. But I can now say combine mean, so take an average of all of those subs, having disregarded the, the uh, rejected pixels. And now I have this guy here. I can actually remove all the rest of them. I'm going to rename it and call it Loom. At Loom to its name. So it's now called Mean M20 Loom. And that is a stack of um, a stack of my Loom subs. And, well, that would be far. <laughs> yeah. I can stick and click this jumping 10 at a time, or I can drag a slider. And this, there's a bit of lag, so it's tricky. Um, but this is pretty clean and pretty high contrast. Um, if I just shift the black point a bit. Um, there we go. That's that's the stacked loom data and it's it's had the the dust donuts, the dust bunnies removed, it's had uh, the thermal noise of the camera removed, it's had the uh, the shot noise of the um, the object um, 
mitigated. It's had the, um, what else, the read noise of the camera. All of those noise sources have been removed. And this is the, um, this is what we've ended up with. And we're going to save that um, as a stacked frame. Now, wouldn't it be nice to know where that was in the sky? I hear you ask. And um, <laughs> I've got a friendly little website I can show you called... Oh, is this the one that I think I know what you're talking about here? I'm talking about... Astronaut. I'm not sure you have enough links saved. <laughs> <laughs> Let's upload that file into astrometry.net and actually see where it is. And there's actually reason behind doing this. We will need to know um, when we come to color calibrate it. But I'm going to start the upload now because it does take a while and uh, we'll come back and look at that later. All right, um, so we've done the loom. And back to the presentation. Um, we've actually, we'll skip this. We'll, we'll come back here. We're not, we're not actually ready yet. What we're going to do now is um, Um, I'm going to, oh, I didn't want to exit. I'm going to open another window here. <laughs> yeah. uh, close all, all right. the images. Uh, let's, let's do the same thing now for the red, the green, the blue. Um, cool. I will let you know that we've probably got about just over half hour left. Have we really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The process is exactly the same for the red, the green and the blue. And um, here in the stacked folder is one I prepared earlier. Aha, look at that. And so here's a red, a green, and a blue. And a loom. Let's see what they look like. So these are the stacks of the red, the green, the blue. Um, so here's the blue. Here's the green, here's the loom we've just seen, and here's the red. So the next thing we need to do is work out what ratio to combine these to get the star color correct. And here's a utility called Excalibrator. And um, here's one I prepared earlier. I'm going to feed it the red. <laughs> the green and the blue. And this is an image that I downloaded from astrometry.net when it plates of the image that has um, world coordinate system data in the header that allows astrometry.net to identify individual stars in these colored subs and to go away and interrogate a database and find out what color those particular stars should be. Ah, that's very cool. And there it is downloading details of the stars. It's found 214 stars that it knows about. And it said that I need to multiply the red by one. That's always one the green by 0.82 and the blue by 0.83. And if I combine those colors in that ratio, the star color will be correct to get if, as determined by these 214 stars. And then that, and that'll in turn get the colors of Trifford right. The colors of Trifford will be what the colors of Trifford turn out at the end of that. Yep. Um, 
a 1.82 of green and I want 0.83 of blue. That's a nifty little toy, isn't it? And at the end of it, I'm happy. I won't. Um, yeah. Well, no, I won't remove them. Here we go. So. Drum roll, please. There's a color image, and it's the software. CCD stack has asked me to show it something that's black. Okay. The, the darkest bit of the, the sky. And if I choose something that isn't black, it won't know, but it'll put a color hue on the whole image. So I know from looking at the subs that this is about the blackest corner. And now it has. Uh, made that box a neutral gray. I'm going to boost the saturation by 10% because that really helps. Yep. And there is my color image. Now, if I go back to the loom, that's a little bit too bright. But I'm going to look at the histogram and um, unselect my little patch. Um, so here, here's the histogram. Um, I don't want to be cropping any shadows, so I don't want any any counts down here at the zero end. Um, if this were an image of a galaxy where the background was just black sky, I'd put this peak somewhere here about 25 counts. But because this image, the background isn't actually black sky, it's dust and hydrogen, I'm actually going to move the, the average background, this peak, at about 50. OK, so that's the, that's the stretch that I want to put on this data. And I'm going to say apply that to all the images and the effect on the blue is pretty ugly but we don't care we're not going to save that we're just going to close the image um, and save those the red but that's what it's done to our color image so the black up here in the corner is neutral black it's it's um it's pretty pretty much equal counts 33 20, it varies a bit but um on average that that rectangle i selected up there is black and the star color for 214 stars here is good as i can get it and the triffid is what the triffid is so i'm now going to rename that to be red green blue m20 red green blue and i'm going to save these two images and stick them in the stack folder. There they are. Now, these are still 32-bit floating point subs, 32-bit um, stacks. Photoshop can't deal with that, so I'm going to change them to 16-bit data, and I'm going to save them as TIFFs. And I can delete these two. And I'm going to save all of those as scaled TIFF files. And that's the data that I take into Photoshop. So we're finished here in CCD stack. It still looks um, amazing as it is even before you've put it into Photoshop. Uh, it's going to look better. Um, <laughs> this is the process that I've actually done a work through for uh, to get to this stage. Um, and people that are watching this on YouTube can freeze the frame and deal with it. But I'm uh, I'm pressed for time now, so um, let's get into. Photoshop. Keep you on your toes. 
Yeah. And let's open those two images. So they're in the scale directory. There they are there. Now I've set Photoshop up to open TIFF. So the TIFF files open in Camera Raw. Yep. And this is one of the slowest parts of the whole process is Sitting opening and two for images in, <laughs> in so, Camera So while we're waiting for that, um, Uri wants to know if we can have a look at the colour histogram, which I think we're going to get to have a look at now, aren't we? There's the colour histogram in, in Camera Raw. There we go. So nice and neutral in the background. A tiny little peak at the at the saturated end. So there are certainly saturated stars there. And the diff the blue and the pink have different shapes. And that's because part of the object's blue and part of the object's pink. Okay, now while I'm here in um, in Camera Raw, I'm going to have a look in the shadows up here. And this is the color image, obviously. And what I'm looking for is color noise. I don't know if you can see it there, but I can. And this is the time that I'm going to hit it. And there are 33 seems to have got rid of the color noise. So I'm going to reduce that a bit. And I'm going to do the same thing with the luminosity noise. Forties seems to have got rid of it. Um, so I'll back that off. And this is a really typical consideration with Photoshop. If the action I've done seems to have solved the problem, I've probably gone too far. So in both of those um, sliders, I will make sure I've not gone too far. And it, it really, I've really found that in Photoshop, Less is more. Now we're looking at the loom, um, looking for noise that's hiding in the shadows. Um, and that's, that's pretty well it. And that is all the noise reduction I will do on this image if all goes well. So now I will save these images, these two, as Photoshop documents in um, Photoshop RGB, um, uh, Prophoto RGB color space, 16 bits per channel. Um, and for reasons I'll get to in a moment, I'm not going to save, I'm not going to push done. I'm going to push cancel. And I'm going to throw away those changes because um, let me just. There's method in your madness here, isn't there? There is method in my madness. These are the two TIFF files that I've just edit, just modified. Well, no, that I've edited in um, in Camera Raw, but I haven't saved them. So these are the unedited raw stacks. So the raw raw. These are the stacks, and they're yeah. they're untouched. That's the way they came out of Camera Raw. And if I go up a directory, here they are in Photoshop. In, as Photoshop files, with that um, with that um, noise reduction incorporated, and the reason I do this is that my imaging workflow is non-destructive. That means that everything I do, um, I I've got the before and the after. 
And here we are, I'm loading those two noise reduced images into Photoshop. And we're going to dance through these at a rate of knots. First thing I do, so I said my, uh, my workflow is non-destructive. It's also documented. So I named this frame the loom frame. I'm going to make two copies of it. And on this one, I'm going to run an action called um, select brightest stars. Select brighter stars. Okay, and this guy is going to uh, find the stars. Whoa! Be... <laughs> that was a bit trippy. trippy. <laughs> yeah, now I'm going to modify that selection. I haven't even had a drink today to either. Expand it. So now I'm selecting the stars and a bit, and I'm going to feather the edge so that the, it's not just selected or um, or not, there's a, uh, a gradient of selection, and I'm going to invert it. And now, if I click this, make that into a, um, a mask, that's a star mask. And I'm going to leave it there, hide it. But I'm going to leave it there for later. Now, here's the second copy I made of the, um, the loom stack. I'm going to run an action on that called local contrast enhancement. Now, is this the sort of process you can do with galaxies as well? Like, is there any difference there, or is this just like a nebula type process? Um, people say that the workflow is different in every image. And to some extent, they are right. But this, it, the, this is a good starting point on any type of image that I've come across. Um, and I might end up doing changing this slightly for a nebula or changing it slightly differently for a galaxy. But it's all basically the same thing. It's oh, all yeah. based on the same. Um, workflow. I so ask I'm because I'm, I'm making it about me and um, I'm curious, I'm, I'm going to try this process with, with my images. So, curious to see if it makes them better. I dare say it will. The, when you when I combine this loom back into the final of the colour image, you'll see the benefit of doing it. Now I've just made a copy of the star mask layer and dragged the mask off on, from that copy and put it onto the local contrast enhanced um, layer. And if I blink this on and off. Oh, wow. The, the, the you stars can see the are, difference there, can't you? Yes. The stars are barely touched, but the contrast is enhanced. Now, why don't I just use a contrast correction? Um, a brightness and contrast layer in Photoshop, for example, to do it. The difference between this, let's disable this guys, doing this, and what I've done is significant. And the difference is that that action increases the contrast in by making things darker. And if you use the contrast slider in Photoshop, it does it mainly in the midtones and the brights. So what I've done here is actually accentuated the dark. Ah, so I had a question on that action list. The action yep. list, is that a plug, the plugin that's mentioned earlier, or is that something that just comes with Adobe? These are Noel Carboni's actions. So these are the Noel Carboni ones. These are the these ones that we the all should download and, and put into our Photoshop and pay our $21.95 US because they really are very good. I think I, I think that's a, a, probably one of the best tips that any of us are going to get from this stream so far today. That's, that's uh, something that I know I could use definitely that's going to improve my images. There's 
there's four or five of them that I use in this process. Now, just moving on really quickly, yep. I'm going to, this is called Stamp Visible Layers, and I'd love to show you how to navigate to it in the layer menu. There is something you can hold alt and push one of these things, but what I want to do is make a layer that looks exactly like this. And the keyboard shortcut on Windows is Control Alt Shift N, Control Alt Shift E. It's the most arcane keyboard shortcut I've ever come across. But what that's done is made a layer that's exactly the same as what was visible. Okay. Now I'm going to make that a soft light layer. And those that know Photoshop will probably know what I'm going to be doing next. And I'm going to make three copies of it. So there are four total. And on the bottom one, I'm going to go filter other high pass and two pixels radius. And that's put a, a really fine sharpening on that layer. Next one up, filter other high pass four pixels, filter other high pass six pixels, and I'm going to reduce the opacity to 75%. Type it in as quicker. I just what I'm doing, and I'll say, I'll say thank you to Alex for the tip because I've got a nightscape that I've been mucking around with from the phone. And I'm going to have to have a go at this now. Filter other high pass eight and 50%. And I'm going to group all those together. Now, just quickly with those other ones, you, you made the, the fourth one 50% opacity. Yep. Did you do that with the other three or just the end one? Uh, the, the two and the four are 100%. The yep. six is 75%. And the eight is 50%. Okay, there we go. I know we would have and got questions about that. I can thank uh, Eric Coles for this. This is uh, something I picked up on um, by watching an Eric Coles video on YouTube. I'm going to call that layer high power sharpening. And I'm going to make another copy of my star mask and drag that onto the group, delete that. So now if I blink that, I've preserved the stars and I've sharpened the nebulosity. Beautiful. And so now I'm going to do another stamp visible, control alt shift N E. In fact, before I do that, let's don't do that yet. I'm going to do um, put a curves layer on this. Um, this process is a bit unusual. A lot of people um, stretch with curves. Um, I've done all the strip stretching in CCD stack. And what I'm actually going to be doing here, I do I'm going to just tone down the brightness of the stars with that curves layer like that. And so it's kind of it's a bit savage, but it's, it's just knocked the stars off a little bit. And because I find I'm very easily confused by things in Photoshop, that that's a, um, a mask there that Photoshop just put on the adjustment layer. It's not used, so I'm just going to delete it. And now I'm going to stamp visible, Control Alt Shift N E, and I'm going to call that Clean Sharp Loom. And I'm going to save this as. M20 loom. And really quickly, I'm going to go over to the RGB, name that layer RGB. I'm going to make a copy of it. And I'm going to find a 
handy dandy action here called <laughs> um, increase star color. So, and I did, it, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so can you, so you're going to copy again, can you just do this process with the colours if you don't don't have luminance? So if you've just got RGB, you Absolutely. can do what you, yep, okay. Absolutely. Um, what I'm doing here is I've made, did it once, then I copied that layer and did it again um, because I don't know how many, how many times I want to do it, but... If I copy this loom, paste it on top, change the new mode to luminosity, and I change the opacity. I can see whether do I like these aqua stars? Not so much. They're a bit less aqua, so I can choose whether I use twice or once or twice with a, a reduction in uh, opacity. Now, that's kind of like the the Triffid we know, but um, it's not very blue. This this setup of mine doesn't doesn't make strong blues. So what I'm going to do is put a um, a curves layer here underneath the loom and I'm going to select the blue channel and I'm going to pin it down here so that I don't want the I don't want the um, the background to be affected by what I'm doing and I'm going to pin it somewhere here because I don't want the stars to be affected and I'm going to grab this middle tone And just ease it up. Oh, look at that. And I'm going to call that. This is a loom. Going to call that our Triffid. Is it a bit too blue? Maybe it is. Maybe we can turn down the, the curves layer. That's amazing. And uh, so the responses are coming in. Tony saying, wow, on that last action. <laughs> and I agree. That was quite something to watch happen. That blue, bringing the blue out. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I think. I think if I put leave this um, running the increased star color twice, it overdoes it. So I'm just going to delete that. Um, a few more steps to do: Controller Shift N E, make a new layer of that. Now there's a one of our handy dandy actions here called make <laughs> star smaller. Um, make star smaller. And what this does is it actually reduces the um, the impact of the stars in the image. If I blink this on and off, oh, yeah. it, 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 it actually darkens the image as well. And so I will keep running that. Until I get the background about as dark as I wanted. There you go, in the background, 16, 17 counts. Dare not go any further than that because if your monitor's not calibrated, you won't, it'll just hang in the blacks. It'll saturate. So there we are. That is um, file save as. That's our finished 
RGB, LRGB image. Yep. And let's call it that. Let's flatten it. And file save as still same. File still save. <laughs> Save as, I'm going to save it as a TIFF. And I'll close all these. Now I can open it up again. This TIFF image is still Profoto RGB. All the process through it has been done in Profoto RGB. So that that is ready to uh, um, talk to your printer about. What I'm going to do now, though, is save it as a JPEG in um, sRGB and that's the format you need for the web. Hmm. So there we go. That is a real rush through the... That was actually um, pretty good. <laughs> it's a, a rush through the Photoshop stuff. Um, I use C, Photoshop CC but I know you can do exactly that in um, CS6 um, you don't need to have the latest and greatest. Um, here's what I did um, and what I didn't show you in the, <laughs> in the loom. We might need to do just like a just a Photoshop specific video um, and get that loaded up separately to this at some stage. Uh, uh, it could be very, very helpful for a lot of people. Yep, I'm very willing and keen to do it. There are people that know a lot more about Photoshop than I do. But um, what, I'm, what I've developed is this, with this workflow is something that um, is non-destructive. So you can go back to any stage in that process and say, oh, I would have preferred if I did something different from here. And so you can pick up at any stage and rework it. It's documented so I can come back to a Photoshop uh, job I did two years ago and know exactly what was in my mind when I was doing it, what, what I did at every step. And it's except for the fact that I pr protect stars, everything that I've done there is across the whole image. I haven't masked out anything and said, oh, this bit's just to address these things. And there's a lot of things you can do in Photoshop that are for specific parts of an image. But this is a global workflow. It applies to the whole image. I think it's, so, a, it's a beautiful image. So I think we might go from the beautiful image to us. <laughs> Not so beautiful image. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions. So we had one earlier uh, from Dominic. Uh, wants to know, how do you work out the best exposure time for one sub for the subject? So is there a process you go through? To work out what you want for a red, what's the best length for illuminance? There is, um, and what what I'll say is that um, mine's probably not optimal. But what I've done is I've worked out um, how long I can take the loom exposures, so I don't saturate too many stars. And depending on what part of the sky I'm imaging. There are certainly saturated stars in the, this image. There are five or six of the brightest stars that are pretty saturated. Uh, but four minutes on with this gear seems to be um, about right. And if I apply the same thing to the color, I still get star color in the RGB data. 
So um, what I started off with was four minutes for LRGB. And then when I bin the color, um, the camera changes the gain as well. So the equivalent exposure time is actually two minutes. Two minutes bin two on this camera is equivalent to four minutes bin one. And, so it's um, sort of equipment and camera specific and testing. It is suck it and see trial and error. And it will be different if you have a CCD camera versus a CMOS camera. But yeah, it's, you, it's affected dramatically by aperture. It's affected dramatically by F ratio. It's affected dramatically by camera technology. You have to, you have to work it out based on all of those things. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tom. That was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, I know I'm going to be going back and watching watching this one again, especially that <laughs> Photoshop section. And I know a lot of people are going to be getting those tools as well. Uh, they um, look like some pretty nifty little tools. They are that's good. That's for sure. Yeah. They are good um, tools. Now, we've got just still got just, we sold about another 20 tickets, I think, raffle ticket wise. There's still a few less left. Just on or just under 200 remaining, I think it is. Um, we can take a break now, have something to eat. We'll be back at two o'clock with our solar session with uh, our solar section director, Russell Cockman. Um, hopefully, we've got someone somewhere that can jump in and give us some live images of the sun. Um, so we'll see you back here at two o'clock. Uh, and if you're enjoying what you're seeing, don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, but once again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Tom, for coming along today. Thanks very much, Mark. Appreciate the help you uh, gave me in preparing this. Not a problem.